Hello Great Minds and you are welcome back to Learn with SOS. My name is Steve Sebastian Ousu, KN USD School of Business. And today I'm honored to walk you through logical fallacies in logic and critical thinking LCT 162. But please, before we get started, don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe for more wonderful contents like this. And also for the YouTube algorithm to recommend this video and subsequent videos to a lot of people around the world. I believe you will do that. Okay, let's begin with our lesson on logical fallacies. What is a fallacy? A fallacy is simply a mistake in reasoning. The moment we come to realize that there is some inconsistencies in the way we reason, there is a fallacy. One example that we are all victims of is the belief that something is wrong just because it makes us angry. For example, an anomalous circumstance or all things being equal, the moment a friend tells you you have a bad breath, you get angry. But does it mean what the person said is wrong? No. So you see, in one way or the other, we are all victims of committing fallacies. So one, we should know the fallacies so that we will know when we are making them or when an arguer is making them. Now, generally, fallacies are dichotomized or grouped into three forms. We have the fallacies of relevance, fallacies of unacceptable premises and formal fallacies. Now let's begin with fallacies of relevance. With fallacies of relevance, they provide premises, but the premises are irrelevant to the conclusion. The premise doesn't support the conclusion at all. So in a way, the premises are not really playing any role here. One common example of fallacy or relevance is the ad hominem fallacy. People call it personal attack or appeal to the person. This fallacy is committed when in an argument, you put the argument down and you attack the person making the argument, either based on the person's um, physical characteristics or the circumstances surrounding that individual. Now, let's look at some forms of this personal attack fallacy or ad hominem fallacy. The first form is what we call the to cook fallacy or the pseudo refutation. This fallacy is committed when we reject arguments because we think the one making the argument doesn't practice what he teaches. We see them as hypocritical. For example, your friend, you know, smoke cigarette. One day saw you smoking cigarette and approached you and said, my friend, or oh, hi pal, it is not good to smoke cigarette. And you reply by saying, so how much have you smoked this morning? So you see, you are attacking the person because the person smokes. That is to cook fallacy. So it's like, what right do you have to tell me to stop? Because you are also doing it. But sometimes the person's, I mean, character is irrelevant to the argument he or she is making. Then another form of um, ad hominem is what we call the poisoning the wall. That is where you tarnish the image of the arguer even before he or she speaks or make an argument. So it's like even you poison the wall before the villagers or the inhabitants come to drink. So. Let's assume we are in a debate. You've made your argument, but before you leave the stage, you, you say bad things about the next opponent. So even before the next opponent comes, the audience has a perception about that individual. So it's like, it's like how people gossip at our backs. So you see, most of us poison the world about people, which is a fallacy. And the last one is what we call the circumstantial ad hominem. That is when we attack people based on the circumstances surrounding them. Let's assume you are the welfare head of a committee and 
there's an issue we want to donate and while you were making the presentation someone just stood up and said after all you are the welfare chair person what else can you say you see that person is i mean putting the claim you are making down and attacking you based on the position you hold that is a circumstantial ad hominem now let's take note of this fallacies are psychologically persuasive but they are logically flawed that means for the first time you hear them it seems logical you might think they make sense because they they elicit some kind of emotive feeling but deep down when you sit down and analyze fallacies very well logically they are flawed they cannot be used in reasoning now the next form of fallacy is what we call appeal to force or the scare tactic as the name connotes here the arguer tries to evoke fear in you imagine a student telling a lecturer that the lecturer should pardon him for absenteeism because he is the chancellor's son so what is the student trying to tell the lecturer that after all you can't punish me i am the son of the chancellor of this university that is appeal to force when you watch movies you see when the boxes are coming you see one of them will be behaving in a way to make the other opponent feel so scared or scared that is what we call the appeal to force then its brother is what we call the appeal to pity here the arguer try to evoke emotions feeling of compassion which is irrelevant to the argument look at the same student telling the lecturer to pardon her for her bad performance because she's an orphan how does being an orphan have any connection with your poor performance this reminds me when we were in first year these src aspirants came to our classes to tell us their policies one of them came with a bandage around the head do you know why whether he was aware or not aware, i just said to myself this is an appeal to pity you want us to vote for you because you think you've gotten a broken bone or broken rib so there's something you need to be very aware sometimes these politicians will come our way and they will appeal to pity most of them you need to be very aware they are all fallacies now let's go to popular appeal or appeal to people or masses there is the feeling that we should follow something we should do something we should listen to something because a lot of people majority of people are doing it now let's look at some of the forms of this popular appeal the first one is what we call bandwagon fallacy that is you believing in something because most people or majority of people say it is so oh i think i need to get a boyfriend or a girlfriend because so far everybody is doing it on campus that is bandwagon like we are following the mass then we have another form of um popular appeal that we call appeal to vanity with this one you won't do what everybody is doing you do what people can really do for you to be respected and admired for example if a your friend tells you you should come to school with a rolls royce so that a lot of people will respect you that is appeal to vanity because generally rolls royce is an expensive car that people like you and i we can't really buy rolls royce so you see it's what we call appeal to vanity then we have appeal to ignorance that is where an arguer claims that lack of evidence proves something so the belief is that because no one has proven something to be true or false that means it is not true or false for example if i make a claim that there is life on mars because no one has proven there is no life on mars so i am saying that since there is no evidence to counter what i am saying it is true that is appeal to ignorance you are appealing to something you don't have any facts about now with appeal to ignorance there is 
a term we need to be very cautious of that is what we call the burden of proof when two people are making an argument the person that makes the positive claim or the counter claim has the burden of proof i say kofi is a girl you are saying kofi is a boy so right now you have to prove if kofi is really a boy so sometimes the law can become a burden of proof in in our normal lives when there is an issue about let's say intellectual property to determine who is right or wrong what do we do we just go to the court and the law will make everything possible that's what we call a um, burden of proof when there is an argument the one who makes the counterclaim has the burden of proof that means that person should prove why he or she thinks the other arguer is making a false claim now we move on to the straw man fallacy this fallacy is committed when an arguer tries to distort an opponent's argument and attack the weakened version so it is straw man because you you try to punch holes in the argument you try to weaken it and um, re reduce the significance of the argument for example let's assume a school setting then the head teacher says this the school lunch budget must be cut to reduce waste then one parent stands up and says this guy want to starve our children you see the headmaster is talking about how to i mean reduce the budget the lunch budget he never said he want to starve the student so you see the second argument b is trying to distort or weaken the argument and and rest on that that is a straw man fallacy you are trying to make the argument look so stupid in the eyes of people then we have the red erin that is whereby an arguer tries to sidetrack the audience by raising irrelevant issues and ignore the original one so it's like a diversion there is a history behind red erin red erin is a, is, is a kind of fish with 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 a smell so sometimes when um in in olden times when um policemen takes these dogs to chase for criminals the dogs are being diverted when when they hear the smell of the fish so they try to go to the sea and catch the fishes not knowing they have i mean some bad guys to catch so red errands you try to divert the argument to something way different no similarity for example we are in a conversation and i say how do we protect the environment and you say we are in the middle of covid-19 let's not worry about that is i am talking about the environment how we protect it you are also talking about covid-19 that is an epitome of red erin and we normally do that now we have fallacy of composition sorry that is where we believe what is true of the parts must be true of the whole it is wrong because we see a has done it b has done it c has done it then we believe that oh then all of them has done it that is fallacy of composition from the parts to the whole example sunny abraham and emmanuel are all good students of supply chain class of 2021 therefore the class of supply chain students of 2021 are all good students which is not correct because the fact that sunny abraham and emmanuel are all good students doesn't guarantee that all the students in the class are good 
then we have um, appeal to authority that is where we regard non-experts as an expert we normally see this kind of fallacy in a lot of advertisements online imagine seeing Lionel Messi saying a herbal product is good now when we hear the name Messi, it's football that comes to your mind. How can he authenticate that a herbal product is good for your health? So you see, in the field of medicine, he is not an expert. But we have regarded him as an expert for advertisement. That's why generally we have any reason or all reason to doubt this um, advertisement. So the moment we take a non-expert as an expert then we are appealing toward authority so we are taking the wrong person we put the person or an individual in the wrong field advertisement is a perfect example of that then we have the fallacy of division which runs with the fallacy of composition with fallacy of division we argue that what is true of the whole must be true of the parts, which is not true. The moment all students in business school or all the students in KNUST are tall, does it mean everyone is tall? No. For example, KSB girls on average are skinny. The whole KSB girls. Therefore, Bella is skinny. No, Bella might be in KSB, but it doesn't mean she is what skinny. That is fallacy of division. So with division, we move from the whole to the parts. By composition, we move from the parts to the whole. Let's check that. Then we have fallacy of equivocation. That is where we use a word in two or more senses to confuse our audience a word is used in a different sense here in another sense is different for example love is blind god is love steve loves Presla. therefore steve is blind just just look at this so you see the word love is used in a lot of senses here so it doesn't make sense that is fallacy of equivocation. Sometimes in adverts to, if you are not careful, you will sign a contract or you will agree to a term not knowing there is a subtle fallacy of equivocation. You wouldn't know before you realize, then you begin to understand that you were misled. So you need to be very cautious of that. Then we have appeal to tradition. That is where we believe something is right because it has been there for long. Oh, it's been there for the past decade. We can't change it. That is what is worrying most of Africans. We, we are stuck to a lot of traditions because our forefathers, our ancestors handed it down to us. And the question is, what are the reasons why you believe what they handed to you are the right thing example people have believed in ghosts for a long time therefore it must be true so there are a lot of traditions that we are appealing to and our main reason is that it has been there we came to meet it no that is a mistake in reasoning that is all for fallacies of relevance. Now let's move to fallacies of unacceptable premises. Here, they provide relevant premises, but it doesn't support the conclusion. Let's check the difference very well. With fallacies of relevance, they provide irrelevant premises. And the moment the premises are irrelevant, they won't support their conclusion. But with this one, Fallacies of acceptable or sorry, fallacies of unacceptable premises. They will give relevant premises, but they don't support the conclusion. Now let's begin with the false dilemma or false dichotomy fallacy. You can call it 
either or fallacy. That is when an arguer presents that or tells you that there are only two options or choices to a problem and only one of them is true. So it's like nothing more, nothing less apart from these two things I've given you. Example, either you go to school or beg on the streets. If a monk or a life coach or any one of high authority tells you this, either you go to school or you beg on the streets. So that means the moment you don't go to school, automatically you beg on the streets. You and I know it's false. That is a false dilemma. You, you restrict something to only two options, to only two choices that only one of them can happen in the absence of the other, which is not true. Then we have the decision point or the psoriasis paradox. This occurs when an arguer rejects a claim because there is no clear cut. The, the, the distinction is so subtle you can't even tell. For example, about abortion. People say when the fetus is two weeks old, you can't terminate it. Others say when it's a week old, you can't terminate it. So there is an argument about when life begins in the womb. It's like everybody has his or her own view. Because of that, any argument someone makes here, you might think is false. Because there is no clear cut after all. There is no generally universally accepted, I mean, clear cuts on that issue, which is wrong. The fact that there is no clear cut doesn't mean a claim or an argument someone makes on that matter is wrong. Then, I don't like pronouncing this fallacy because it always makes me slip. Okay, I'll try. My fellow Ashantis, help me here. Slip, please. Oh my God, I said it. Hey, yeah, you mentioned. With this type of fallacy, that's the assumption that um, if you do something, it results in other things and it will continue in that regard. That is the something slope fallacy. It's like the moment you slip on a, a wall and the wall is sloping, what do you do? Well, what happens? You keep moving uh, till you get to the end. Mm -hmm. So it's like a chain of reactions. The moment you trigger one, it follows in that order. For example, you tell your friend, do not live in Accra. If you do, you'll be tempted to spend much. You'll be in real debt and you'll be tempted to borrow. You will have to start gambling and end in jail. This is what we call slippery, whatever, slope fallacy. So you see, does, does it mean that the moment you get to Accra, you, 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 you spend so much? No, there are people who are managing their expenses wisely in Accra. They are not in jail, they don't borrow. They are not in debt, they are making money. Now we move to hasty generalizations. That is when a conclusion is made about a group with inadequate information. We normally do it. There are a lot of stereotypes we have about a lot of people, but we don't have enough information. And hasty generalization is a fallacy of unacceptable premises. Now we have already explained the slippery slope or the chain reaction. That is where you believe without good reason that an event will lead to another event. So the example is what we gave already. Then we have appeal to authority. You already talked about that one. 